Welcome back to Razmafsar TV. Today, I'm really happy to have Bob, Bob Brooks, back here on our channel. Hi, Bob. How are you doing today? Hi. Hi, Manashe. Good to see you again. Today, we are going to talk about a very interesting or important uh, treatise or manual, which is the manual of uh, Talhofer, Hans Talhofer. And the reason I... Uh, I'm uh, going to, or we are going to discuss it because uh, lately I have uh, interviewed many people, many colleagues, and then I realized most of them, not all, most of them are in Italian swordsmanship. And most of them told me that Italian swordsmanship is a very complete system. It, everything is, for example, like Fiora is in Fiora, it's not like German system where you can find one bit here, another bit there, and it's a complete system and so on. So then, um, Okay, I mean, uh, put it this way, um, as you know, I, I live in Germany, and so, okay, first of all, I'm very interested in German manuscript, but another thing which I also find it very uh, sad, because I speak Spanish, that the Spanish manuscripts are also neglected, so uh, I had the feeling that mostly is everyone is talking about Italian. That's why I have, I mean, I already interviewed a colleague of us, which is going to be here on this channel on Spanish Destres on manuscripts, in Spanish I interviewed him. But um, then I um, said, okay, now let's uh, just interview someone, an expert who is Bob on German manuscripts. And then we are going to start today only with Talhofer, Hans Talhofer. First of all, Bob, please explain to me why most of HEMA people or Western martial artists are interested in Italian system and not in German system. There is a, there is a, um, a, a, a large, fairly quiet um, community of German uh, enthusiasts. Um, one, of the, one of the things that attracts people, for example, if we look at the 15th century, uh, if we look at 15th century HEMA, uh, which is my area that I'm, that I'm particularly interested in. If we look at 15th century HEMA, uh, there is a large number of German manuscripts and relatively few Italian. Um, so when we, look at, uh, when we look at the Italian um, methods for fencing, we find uh, only really two between 1400 and 1500, um, which are um, Fiori di Liberi and um, uh, Filippo Vari de, Pisi, uh, de Pisa, uh, who is... Um, arguably the earliest Renaissance fencing master to write a manuscript because his methods are quite advanced for the time. Uh, whereas with, so the, the beauty with Fiori's methodology is it covers everything uh, in one manuscript. And of course there are four copies or four versions of Fiori's manuscript and each one with subtle, so, so, some subtle differences, but sometimes a few major differences obviously written um, over a period, uh, you know, and written over a period of time, ways made additions and redactions. Um, but the beauty about Fiori's method is it is uh, complete. He begin. He has wrestling, the dagger, the sword in one hand, the sword in two hands, spear, poleaxe, armored fighting, um, and all uh, unarmored, unarmored fighting, uh, and also horsemanship. So it's very complete. When we look at um, the German manuscripts, we find that uh, they are written by different authors, oft, often in the same tradition, uh, but they, there is a lot of um, there's a lot of separation between um, uh, the, the, the various the various weapons. So we uh, so there's not the, the sense of cohesion that we find with the Italian material, which makes in a sense the Italian material as a whole system. Um, more available to study, but when you look at the when you when you look at the German language material, you know, for example, um, you might have uh, you, you, you know they all they'll all cover longsword, um, but to find Mesa, you, you'll have to you may have to move out of a particular tradition or or, or set of practices. Um, for Pollux, you may have to look at another one, and so there's nothing really authored in completeness. Uh, and that's what makes it a little more difficult. And the, the interesting thing about um, Hans Talhofer is he follows the model pretty much of most fencing books, although um, with the differences that there's, 
not not always an annotation as to who the author of the material is or whose method it is, with the exception of the very famous German uh, master, uh, Johannes Lichtenauer. Um, but Han Hans Tollhofer's manuscripts are very, very interesting. They don't offer a lot of text, uh, but they have some of the most beautiful images uh, recorded in that, in that century, uh, especially when you compare to some of the other manuscripts where the images are fairly rudimentary. Uh, his are noted for their, uh, for their anatomical beauty. Um, one of the things I always I, I find incredible about Hans Tollhofer's manuscript is the depictions of horses are absolutely incredible. Um, <laughs> but again, in typical 15th century fashion, um, matters of perspective get a little blurred. Uh, so interpreting directly from a, from a, from a picture, from a, from a still plate and tr trying to infer movement into that is quite, can, be quite, can be quite tricky. And this is not just common of Talhofer, this is common across, across that field. But Talhofer as a character is very, very interesting. Um, he's a very, very colourful man with a very colourful history. Okay, let's start first of all, I mean, this is one of the pictures I can show it to you, I mean, <laughs> right, to our viewers, <laughs> the horses he shows, right, beautiful, yes. but uh, before we go ahead, who was Hans Talhofer? Tell us so about Hans, him. Hans Talhofer was a, an, a, a fencing master, um, who we we know a, we know a little about his life because he, he was widely he, he published uh, at least uh, five fencing manuscripts uh, between um, 1443 and 1467. Um, some of these are quite considerable works; they're quite large um, uh, uh, volumes. Um, the interesting thing is that he we know he was a mercenary. And that he was involved in uh, some mercenary type activities, uh, effectively a sword for hire. Um, <clears throat> we also know that he was a bona fide fencing teacher. Uh, again, from the records that that we that we we found about him, um, and he also had some very very well off prestigious clients uh, who we who he names. We have we we know who they are. Um, where he gets interesting for me is that he straddles two, at least two traditions. Uh, so <clears throat> he mentions the uh, uh, and and records some of the work of Johannes Lichtenauer, although he doesn't seem to have a, a an authoritative connection to that tradition because we know the name of the Lichtenauer masters. Uh, who who lived in these uh, alongside him? In fact, contemporaneous in a number of uh, in a number of cases, uh, the Lichtenau masters who were active in um, the German speaking part of the Holy Roman Empire at that point. Uh, but he also includes some very very um, uh, a, a common or what we could best term common material, uh, treating um, weapons such as the Messe and the sword and buckler, which are viewed as being generally of a lower class uh, of, of weaponry to the knightly traditions that Lichtenauer particularly is interested in. So the client base becomes interesting. Um, and, and it's evident that Talhofer is not just interested in the, in the fighting arts of the nobility uh, or, or the professional man-at-arms, but also the fighting arts of the peasantry, um, because he himself is a commoner. And we think he was perhaps born, or, or the best guess is he was born sometime between 1410 and 1415 and died sometime after 1482. Uh, his lineage, who taught him, is unknown. But um, what we know certainly from uh, a few of his manuscripts that he was a very well-educated well man. Uh, apart from fencing, uh, covering fencing in his treatises, he covers subjects such as astrology, mathematics, onomastics, uh, the um, the, octorit uh, the octoritas, the ratio. Uh, so this is a man who's uh, who's well versed in the sign in the in the liberal arts and sciences of the period. Um, so is a is a very uh, is a very complex character. It's not particularly easy to pin him down. 
Um, but thankfully, the evidence uh, has, or the, the story of his life has grown quite considerably in the last few years with some tremendous discoveries made by, by um, researchers uh, that tie him to certain events. Um, and there's a few uh, fairly colourful ones, um, in his, especially in his early career, when he was clearly working as, um, as, a, as a mercenary uh, in the context of, of bringing people to, uh, to, to justice uh, on behalf of the authorities. Um, so while he's authoring, uh, so while later, he's, uh, after 1443, he's author, uh, uh, authoring beautiful fencing manuscripts, uh, he's still very active. In a, he's not just teaching fencing, he's still very active. And a record that was discovered recently, um, which I'll, I'll, I'll talk about in a, in a, uh, in a, in a little more, at a little more length, um, gives a, f f a, one of the most unique insights into the interplay between fencing masters uh, in, uh, in, in, in southern Germany uh, in this period. Um, so uh, uh, I would say perhaps one of the most, most interesting characters within uh, early fencing. Uh, you know, we, we have the like uh, contemporaries uh, such as Paulus Karl, Peter von Danzig, um, active in that period. Uh, but also we have, um, you know, during Hal Talhofer's time, um, uh, a number of manuscripts, are, uh, certainly within that, within that time frame, um, uh, appearing. So uh, Fiore de Libri's manuscripts are earlier, they run from about 1410 to about 1420. So at the, when Talhofer was a child, but, you know, towards the end, and we obviously people tend to write manuscripts in later life, um, you know, we, we have him existing contemporaneously with another, a, a number of masters whose records we also have. Um, and, and, and I would say by far, he's, he's one of the most colourful uh, he, he led a very, very interesting life. <laughs> okay. Uh, let me just ask you before we go ahead, when did she die? At what age did she die? We're not sure. Um, it, it, there's some suggestion that it, it's possibly it, it's sort of in the late 1470s, early 1480s. So he would have, he seems to have lived to a good age. Um, because, uh, and again, there's manuscripts. Um, we have a depict in, in the manuscript, in, in the one, you, the, the, the version you have, which is a copy of this 1467 manuscript. Um, we have images of him. We know what he looks like. Which really? Is really? In this really, one? Really, really, yes, we have images of what he looks like. He posed for a portrait uh, in a, in a, uh, with, a, with a flag, um, with a banner and, uh, and, a, and a motto. So he is, he is in there. I'm not, I couldn't tell you offhand what, page you'll find it but yeah i would really see. love to see what he looked like and, and 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 curiously when we look at the image when we look at that portrait we can see him in the fencing manuscript so he's the one with the uh with he looks a little bit like robert plant found him found him he looks a little he looks a little bit like robert plant uh from led zeppelin so yeah yeah he, uh, he's a uh, he's uh yes and and if you and if you if you look at that, if you note the face, you will see him repeatedly throughout the manuscript. Um, <laughs> this is interesting. I didn't know that. So he's, uh, yes, so we know what he looked like. Um, <laughs> Very interesting. Okay. And then, okay, he, you said that he wrote, wrote a, a number of manuscripts. And this yes. one was the first, or you, you cannot tell? So this one, the, this is the, the, the manuscript he penned in 1467, which was the last manuscript oh, the last um, the final manuscript um so when we look at them chronologically there's a vast improvement in quality uh in terms of the in terms of the scribe work and uh in terms of the particularly in terms of the illustrations um and he also names his illustrators as well and his scribes so we have a record of who recorded it and we can compare the artwork to man other manuscripts that uh were um were authored at the time. Some, some might not mention, but we can see similarities. Uh, so we know that there were a number of scribes and illustrators alongside these fancy masters who were very active in this period as well. It must have been a very good living to make as uh, to draw pe pictures of people fighting um, because these books uh, were, you know, expensive objects that often ended up in the hands of, of very prestigious clients. 
And yeah. so it's a great way to advertise one's skills uh, mm -hmm. is, to, is to illustrate a fight manuscript because you're going <clears> to, <throat> especially when you're looking at the manuscripts that are aimed at members of the, the aristocracy, because then yeah. your work is being pushed into that, into that audience. Yeah. Um, so there's a lovely symbiosis of, of, of talent being brought into play. Uh, when you when you look at uh, when you look at the, the, the complete construction of the manuscript, uh, so Bob, do we have reprints of all his manuscripts? Um, so the uh, yes, I th uh, well not all of them, but certainly the most important have been reprinted. Um, yeah. There is the, the 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 so the three major manuscripts: fourteen forty three, fourteen fifty nine, fourteen sixty seven, and then two others which were written. Um, for uh, written as, as uh, specifically for um, for a, a purpose for specific clients. So the the most interesting is the 1459, uh, and there's a suggestion that the 1459 manuscript is Talhofer's own personal copy um, because it contains a cornucopia of material, not just fencing related, but uh, uh, but uh, uh, chiefly a, 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 a facsimile of Conrad Kieser's Bellafortis, which is the famous 15th century book on um, siege warfare, weaponry, um, battle. Uh, also curiously has astrological tables, um, alchemical recipes, um, invocations. So it's, it's, a, it's a good um, it's a good vessel to peer inside his mind um, because th th this volume certainly is a collection of things that are important to him. Um, and so we find lots of, you know, lots of very unusual things, but also we find a lot of, inf we get a lot of information from that manuscript about his fencing practices. Uh, 1443 is fairly rough and ready. It's not a particularly... Um, refined manuscript to look at. The 1459 is uh, a much better product, if you can use that word. It's, it's, there's more care and attention has been taken in its, in its creation. And the 1467 is very much the Ferrari of, of Talhofer's manuscripts. Uh, beautiful illustrations. Well, beautiful. When I hear many people in Western martial arts or in European martial arts, so many people say, I follow the paths of Fiore, or I follow the paths of Lichtenauer, or I follow the paths of this and that. Mm. I hardly see anyone say, I am using Talhofer methods. Why not? Um, Talhofer doesn't contain a lot of information for the uninitiated. Uh, so Talhofer I use personally, I use Talhofer as an appendix. Uh, to more complete better, um, more complete manuscripts with more text. Uh, so, for example, in the when when I was looking at writing the Mesa book uh, on Mesa fighting uh, in the peasant tradition, so before the magnum opus of Hans Le Kushner in 1478, everything that came before, very fragmented. There are sections here, sections there. Uh, Tauhofer contains some beautiful Mesa work, but he only includes a line of text uh, with a lot, and the illustrations are clear. Um, so, Tal but Talhofer, when taken in totality with other manuscripts in that period, can provide some very useful insights. And so, for example, one thing we found is if we look at the in some of the Mesa plays, where, for example, the Glasgow manuscript has some has some fairly complete descriptions of the individual plays, eleven plays in total. Um, but no illustrations. Mm. It's very interesting to find that what Glasgow is describing in a play, for example, appears in Talhofer in an illustration. Um, and, this, and in fact, in, in Glasgow, there are um, at least three examples where the play is described and Talhofer provides the picture. Uh, and so when you look at Talhofer, you know, you, you'll know things that you can't get or, or that are not mentioned in the text such as the positions of the feet, little, t little ways that the feet are slightly turned out to enable the hips to engage. So that for, a, for somebody who analyzes martial arts uh, from manuscripts, this is, this is a gold mine. 
but it's knowing where to look. And so if you were to take Talhofer in isolation, um, he is quite a difficult source to learn from uh, without the benefit of, of understanding other manuscripts, contemporaneous manuscripts uh, from, that, from that period. So, it, it, so he's not a great place to start. Okay, so this is, you said, the, la uh, the Ferrari of what he performed, right? Yes. But, okay, let's talk about this. How many weapons does he talk about in this? Um, so he looks at, um, so the, 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 what you would consider to be the, um, the, the kind of normal, <laughs> if that's ever a word with weaponry. So you look, we have longsword, messer, dagger, sword and buckler, um, polax. Yeah. bits of spear then we have some really really unusual things so we have he covers judicial combat yeah many people know as trial by combat is that one um, judicial combat yes uh so judicial combat using the stack shield or the the stabbing shield also known as the haken shield uh and so <laughs> these giant pervises uh, that are used in this i would say highly ritualized um, um, form of combat which is used to decide who is going to be judged to be right by God in God's eyes. And alongside the, the, the dueling shields, he also shows um, an example of a man and a woman fighting a judicial duel. Uh, and this is perhaps one of the most unusual things that appears in any manuscript, uh, where the, the man uh, is standing in a in a circular pit in the ground, a very small one, so not much room to move. Uh, up to his, <laughs> uh, coming up to the level of his waist, yes, I and he's armed with a wooden mace, a wooden club, and the woman is armed with uh, her veil, her head veil, into which she has tied a two pound rock. Uh, and she can run around the outside quite freely while the man is constrained within the confines of the pit. And I think this is obviously to balance out the advantage of aggression and strength, uh, yeah. physical strength. Um, and there the are wooden maces, right? Like this one. Am yes, so right? known as Colbin. Uh, Colbin. So this is Colbin. So this is a wooden mace. So we find the dueling shield also being fought with, um, fought with the Colbin and also with the longsword and, and on its own. So he, it's fairly comprehensive. Now, Paul MacDonald, um, the sword maker and master of arms who lives in Edinburgh, um, back in our day, back in the 1990s and early 2000s, well, Paul MacDonald constructed arguably the first pair of dueling shields that had been made since Talhofer's time. And we played with them. And I have some video of us demonstrating the use of the, the use of the dueling shield at the, Is it on your channel Bob at the Royal Museum of Scotland yes uh, on uh, on Chamber Street there so um, and when you one of the things we, we discovered when we when we began to practice and and, and practice them the the method of fighting with these things I mean they're huge that they're, they're, they're as, as tall as a man shaped like a you know, they've got hooks on them and spikes on them. Um, we found that, you know, they're 20, 20 kilos in weight. Uh, they're, they're, they're monstrous. But we found that they're incredibly subtle. Uh, There's such a subtlety in the, in, in the movement dynamic of using these things, especially when you're using them with a weapon, uh, with, a, with, a, with a weapon in the, in the right hand or the, the, the dominant hand. Um, so the dueling shields was a really f fantastic uh, oh. experience and experiment. Does he provide any information about the weight, or the weight was a guess? He, uh, the weight was a guess. Um, now, the, again, even the construction was guesswork because there isn't that he has some illustrations both front and back of how they're constructed. Um, but again, whether the, 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 and there's so many different types shown as well. Now, Talhofer is not the only manuscript to show these weapons. Uh, the dueling shield, uh, Paulus Cow also shows them. Uh, so that it's they're not not that um, they're restricted just to Talhofer. Um, but you get some, for example, that look like a, an oval. Uh, they're perhaps covered in rawhide um, to fight uh, to you know to attach 
steel furniture spikes to the tops and bottoms, uh, or, or you know, they, they must have been quite substantial. And so, using you know, using the the best materials we had at the time, um, yeah, their weight is is quite considerable. I would imagine that some of them are far lighter, uh, so they may be in the vein of a shield that's designed to take a lot of damage rather than your body taking a lot of damage so that they literally fall apart as you're using them. Um, but they, they, they're, um, they're, they're, they're substantial um, in their dimensions. And, and, and again, so we found that the finished weight of these things was, you know, was getting on for like 40 pounds in weight. Uh, do you imagine throwing a 40 pound shield around with in one hand? Uh, it's, it's a very, uh, it's a very, it's a very fun way to fence. Uh, if I can, if, if, uh, it's it's so hard to describe how it feels to fight with one of these things. Never mind fight fight to the death with one. Um, and Talhofer's manuscript is full of people being hooked and speared, and oh. so I can imagine that fighting with these things for real uh, would have been incredibly brutal. Do do we have a surviving example? Um, now we, there are pavisas. Uh, I'm not aware of any dueling shields, uh, but there's certainly pavisas, uh, um, which were used mainly for crossbowmen to yeah. put in the ground and, and act literally like a like a like a wall in front of them. Yeah. Uh, so, but dueling shields, I don't think we've we've seen any. Um, I saw any... pavisas in Musée de Armée, Les Invalides yes. in Paris. Yes, yes, very big ones. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so yes, there are. Um, the, yeah. Uh, so one of the other unusual things that we find uh, again, Talhofer shows it beautifully, but it, it does appear elsewhere. Are some of the small hand shields, some of the bucklers, and Talhofer's look like a giant lemon squeezer. Uh, <laughs> Let me see very, if I can find odd. it. Um, yeah. Now I I was fortunate uh, and blessed to be given a beautiful facsimile. Uh, which unfortunately is in the fencing kit cupboard at our hall. I would have brought it out and showed you it, but I can certainly provide a picture uh, that you might splice into the video. Um, is it here? Uh, uh, yes, in there. Uh, there's a. And now I was fortunate and blessed to be given a, an incredible facsimile as a gift by Nick Harrison of Readout Forge in New Zealand uh, when I was there teaching uh, Mesa and Longsword, uh, and. These things are, they're covered in flanges and fluting. And uh, so if you look at his sword and buckler section, you'll see the most incredible hand shields. They're, uh, now Cal, again, Cal, Cal's another. Uh, interestingly, Cal is perhaps one of the more contemporaneous masters in the same geographic area as, uh, as Hans Talhofer. And curiously, he, uh, Carl's manuscript in, in a lot of respects mirrors uh, some of the unusual things we see in Hans Carl's manuscript. Um, so these odd shields, Carl's, some of Carl's have faces on them uh, with tongues sticking out. So it's, it's, it's very, very interesting to see. Uh, oh, yeah, everything to me is a human process. Is uh, you know, everything, uh, when we look at the construction of weapons or the construction of shields, there's, there's a human thought process has gone into this. And when you look at the shapes of these things, and the interesting thing for me is how did they devise these? There must have been a lot of experimentation or, um, or you know, uh, uh, not necessarily in their time, but to get to this point. Um, so this, so again, um, Talhofer is a treasure trove for the curious. There's, uh, there's, it's an Aladdin's cave. You can walk in and find things, and you think it's one of the illustrations in the 1457, uh, sorry, the 14, uh, 1459 edition, for example, of some dueling in the barriers with sword and with Messer and Buckler. Some of the fences. Just before we go ahead, this is what you mentioned <laughs> before, right? Yes. This uh, woman. Very, very strange. And, and interestingly, in many respects, I think in the majority of the fight finishes the woman is winning which i like to see that i like it's very it's very uh um it, it's it's uh it's very um egalitarian for uh, <laughs> yes, the 15th yes. century 
when you look at the majority of 15th century manuscripts, <laughs> look um, at this. <laughs> it pulled upside down into the pit. Yeah, so this um, it, it's yeah. incredibly. Uh, it, it, it's just uh, it, it's hard to find words to describe the the joy I feel when I look at a, a copy of a copy and of one of. Interestingly, he has also full armor fighting. Yes, and in fact, he um, some of the uh, he authored one of his manuscripts for um, a knight called Leotold von Königsegg. Now, the name's interesting, Königsegg, because we now know the Königsegg family um, are in Sweden and they make supercars. So I don't know whether they're necessarily um, necessarily related to the Königseggs of southern germany at this for, or uh, at this point but it seems like a strange coincidence that you have very wealthy people with this uh, uh, with this aristocratic surname in you know buying and commissioning expensive fencing manuscripts and we now have a Koenigsegg family who produce some of the most expensive and uh, and um, and far out cars in the world so so he wrote uh, so he provided um, and not only did Tarhofer provide the manuscript he also trained uh, the, so the manuscript, in many respects, as we think, for a number of many, a number of those which were gifted noble patrons, were aid uh, were aid memoirs uh, to allow them to re to um, to review or revise what they'd been taught in person. Um, but the uh, so the uh, so with um, uh, the the Koenigsegg um, the the, the uh, no, I, I'm just looking at the manuscript name. The, the, manu, the manuscript 19, uh, 19 Roman numeral 173. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so the he was serving the Koenigseggs sometime between 1446 and 1459 and produced this manuscript. And the work depicts a judicial duel being fought by Leotold von Koenigsegg, as well as the training Talhofer gave him for in preparation. Uh, however, it seems that the duel never took place, uh, which is interesting. So they went to the expense of having Talhofer train them uh, and produce this money and produce a manuscript. Um, but uh, we can't find anything that suggests Le Leotold von Koenigsegg actually fought the duel he was intended to fight. Um, I mean, amongst the other the, the other clients, uh, the other manuscript that was produced specifically was um, produced for two brothers, uh, uh, David and Bupelen von Stein, 